John chapter 3, is everybody there say amen? amen. Well, that was kind of halfway there, but you know, this sleeping weather, I don't mind you. If you go to sleep today, just go to sleep, all right? If you're tired of sleep, and, and I won't even ask you to stand. I won't do that to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us to live. And in spite of, Lord, the devil and a wicked world and a corrupt flesh, we're grateful to know you, that you're God and that you change not. And that, Lord, we can find some stability, stableness and consistency in this world in you. And we praise you for that this morning. We are thankful, Lord, that you're eternally holy. That there's no variableness nor shadow of turning in your character and in your essence. We're thankful, Lord, that your love for us is everlasting. We're thankful, Lord, that you're holy, eternally holy and eternally righteous. We thank you, Lord, that you're a good God and a gracious God. A God who will in no wise clear the guilty, but have made a substitute and a sacrifice for the guilty. And Lord, I am guilty. And I thank you, Lord, that your precious word made me see my sin, my wretchedness, my evilness, the depravity of my heart. And you caused me, Lord, to see the need of a savior. And you, Lord, you brought me to the end of my own righteousness and made me, Lord, fall at the foot of the cross and lay hold of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we say with the Apostle Paul today, not being found in mine own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning that you gave your life for our sin. We thank you that you are God Almighty, the Creator. We thank you, Lord, for revealing truth in your word. We thank you for preserving your word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path that we can read it and see ourselves, see this world, see you, and know the truth. Lord, we're so thankful this morning for the truth. Give us truth today, God. I pray, Lord, that you may be glorified in this service. We thank you for the Bible class hour, for the singing, for the fellowship, for the prayers. But Lord, we've come to the hour of preaching and we need once again for the anointing and power of the Holy Ghost. For Lord, if I preach without the Holy Spirit's help, these people will be worse off than when they came. But Lord, if you will come and you will speak to the inner spirit of these people while I preach outwardly, there'll be none of us leave here but what having received good from you today. I pray, Lord, that our hearts will be tender before you, open before you, receptive, Heavenly Father, to the truth. And Lord, today you know that it's just like it was the first time I ever stepped behind the pulpit. I am but a child and know not how to go in nor to come out. Please help us preach today in a way that bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray again that you forgive us of our sin and iniquity. That we wouldn't hinder the work of the Holy Spirit. And dear Lord, I ask today especially that if there are those in this building in the sound of my voice or that will be over CD or tape, Heavenly Father, or over the internet, that are lost and never been born again. I pray God in heaven that a great work of the Holy Spirit would be done. That mysterious work that Jesus mentioned about the wind, that even though we can't comprehend, we know it's there. I pray God today that the Holy Ghost of God, the sweet spirit of God would work deeply in the hearts of people. And Lord, there's one thing I don't want to do. I do not want to stand at the judgment and have people look at me and say, why didn't you tell me that I must be born again? 
I don't want people, Lord, to look at me and say, you preached on clothes and you preached on music and you preached on this and that. And you preached on marriage and finances, but you never preached on being born again. Lord, I pray today, help me to discharge this holy duty of preaching from this mountaintop of scripture. And Lord, may we send this message as far as, Lord, you are willing to take it, that a man must be born again to enter heaven. Oh, God, today I also want to pray that the challenges and the battles that these folks face this week, the coming days in their life, through the joys and through the sorrows, through the heartache and through the healing, that, Lord, they will constantly draw nearer and nearer to you and that the things of this world will gradually fade away and that, Lord, we will desire only to look into the face of our Lord Jesus Christ and do that for which we were designed and created, worship him and praise him and bring glory to his holy name. Lord, I pray help these folks and their families, the spiritual attacks and the fiery darts that come. Help them to make it through and know they can make it through, Lord, if we'll humble ourselves before your mighty hand. Help us not to live in some kind of religious, spiritual fantasy world where we think that we won't have trouble and trial and tribulation and heartache and sorrow. But, oh, God, help us to know that when we at last see your face, it'll be worth it all. Amen. So, Lord, help us to lift up our hearts and our spirits in glad hope today and in the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. And help us lay hold of the promises of God and the truth of God's word. And to live in the victory that's been wrought for us at the cross and at the tomb. And, Lord, we pray with old John the Apostle. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. But I'm asking you, God, today that you'll save the lost. Use this preaching of your word to save. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Last week we preached on chapter 2 where Jesus cleansed the temple on Sunday night. And I want to say that in reference to this, that John chapter 3 occurred right after the cleansing of, or soon after the cleansing of the temple. Now, I want you to think with me for just a minute. Jesus goes into the temple area where the scribes, the priest, the religious elite of the world were running their business. And he drove out the money, he drove out the sheep and the oxen and so forth. And he overturned the money tables and he drove them out of the temple and he cleansed the temple. When you get to John chapter 3, there's a man that comes to Jesus by night. His name is Nicodemus. Nicodemus was part of that culture that Jesus just drove out. This is not a light deal. It's a very serious, serious passage of scripture. And a man comes to Jesus by night and he is part of that culture of which Jesus just drove and cleansed out the, the, the temple area. And if you really want to read what Jesus thought about and knows about those people, read in Matthew chapter 23. You have never read anything like it by any religious person in the world where he says you vipers and you serpents, where he said you can pass land and sea to make one proselyte, but he said you make a more twofold child of hell than you are yourself. He basically said this, you're the blind leading the blind. You're taking people to hell by your religious nonsense. And what I want you to know is that this man, Nicodemus, is a man who is smack in the center of this religious world that Jesus Christ cleansed out and exposed for what it was. And I have to give a lot of credit to Nicodemus because when you're in high places and you're in the caliber of society that he was in, and when you are raised in and webbed into your life, that kind of uh, culture he was in, it's not easy uh, to break loose from it. Don't ever, ever underestimate people being trapped in religion or so forth. It's not easy to break loose from pride and so forth. 
but he comes to Jesus and we'll begin reading in verse one. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. That tells you a lot about him right there. Jesus Christ was a lot more than a teacher. That's kind of, you know, that's quite a statement to reveal what's really going on. A teacher come from God for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, and I'll tell you something, Jesus cuts to the chase. He doesn't say, thank you. That was nice of you to say that. I appreciate your encouragement. All that kind of nonsense. He cuts right to the chase with Nicodemus, cuts off all the nonsense and says something to him. And I will tell you, he says it to every one of us. Jesus answered and said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I want you to know something this morning. I'm, I want to be very clear about what I'm preaching. I am not here to impress you. I'm not here to make you like me. That's okay. That's, that's good. That's fine. I'm not here to make you go out of church and say that was a great message. I am here preaching today on the necessity of the new birth. That if you have never been born again, you must be born again or you will die and go to hell. And I'm here today to preach that it's not a bad thing to examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith. And I'm going to ask you front, front and center right now, everybody in this building, have you truly and honestly been born again? Somebody needs to challenge you that in your life. If you have been born again, I'm thankful. I rejoice with you. But if you have not been born again, this is your Sunday. This is your day. Please listen to the message of God. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse four, Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind, and lock that verse in on your soul, verse 7, you must be born again. God did not say that you must quit chewing tobacco. Never says that one time in the word of God. God never says, you must wear your dresses below the knee. He does teach modesty. God never says you must about a lot of things. He does say that a servant of the Lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men. But he says you must be born again. A lot of times we're preaching things like people must do this and must do that and must not do this or must do this. And we, and we imply these things. Not, it's not in the scripture. What is in the scriptures, you must be born again. The older I get and the farther I go, the more I realize that all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. And that we have to be born again. And that Christianity is not about doing good things and being nice and quitting this or doing this or doing that. It's about being born again of the spirit of God, a new nature, a new man in Christ Jesus. It's a big subject and I won't be able to cover near all of it this morning. But I want you to hone in on that verse, you must be born again. Charles Wesley and, and John Wesley, who started the Methodist movement back in 1700s, uh, John Wesley was asked one time, why do you constantly preach you must be born again? And he simply answered, because you must be born again. And so I want to tell you this morning, I don't want to stand before the judgment bar of Almighty God. I rejoiced about Matthew getting saved today, this week. And that's what we're here about is seeing people get saved. I would like for you to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I'd like to grow myself. But growth is impossible without new birth. And you must be born again. And verse number eight says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So, it, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, art thou master of Israel and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen 
and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from, come, came down from heaven, even the son of man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. I want to begin this morning by saying Nicodemus was a religious man, and yet he was not born again. He was a Pharisee, and Pharisees were very strict, very separated people. Uh, Brother Ruckman this morning mentioned uh, about independent Baptists. I'm as close to an independent Baptist probably doctrinally as anything that you can get out there if you're trying to attach me somewhere to, to a group. I believe their doctrine is, is a lot. But I will tell you, he brought up some things that there's a problem sometimes with that. And that is this, uh, the strictness and the standards and the separation becomes uh, their pride point oftentimes. But I respect them. I appreciate them. And, uh, and, and I owe a debt of love and, and gratitude to them for it. But here's what I want to say. There's no use me sitting up here and talking about the Pharisees this morning if we're not going to apply that to our own life. A Pharisee was a legalist. And a legalist teaches that you do things to be saved. It's how good you live to be saved. Legalism is being saved by keeping of the law or keeping of a list of standards and so forth uh, that somebody sets up. Legalism is, is, is rejecting being saved by grace and believing that you're saved by how well you live. And legalism can come in all kinds of forms. It can come in uh, saying, well, if, if men don't keep their hair cut short, uh, you can't be saved. That's legalism. If the women don't wear the dresses long, that's legalism. That women wear dresses to be saved. You don't wear dresses to be saved. You wear dresses for modesty and to, uh, for identification. By the way, I'm going to preach in a few Sundays a message on that, on the uh, purposes of dress in the Bible. And, and it'll be a teaching message. I think it'll help you. You'll enjoy it. But uh, if I preach that you uh, that if you quit drinking, that'll save you. That's legalism. Uh, if I preach that uh, uh, wearing mascara or makeup uh, will send you to hell, that's legalism. Does everybody follow me? You are saved not by how you uh, dress or how you live. You are saved by the redemptive, substitutionary, sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross, period, plus nothing. Now, the Bible teaches very clearly that when a man is saved, he ought, it ought, ought to and will be followed by good works. There will be a change as a result of being saved. But you're not changing to be saved or doing things to be saved. If you do right, you do right because you're saved, not to be saved. That's the difference between legalism and grace. But these Pharisees were strict. They were separatists. And they were trying their best to live under the law of the Old Testament. Their righteousness was of the law. They had a form of religion, according to Christ, but they did not have the substance of it. They had a shadow, but not the substance. They kept the Sabbath. Uh, by the way, one of the quickest ways that somebody that's under legalism is if they keep the Sabbath and reject people that worship God on Sunday. The disciples met on the first day of the week. It speaks of grace. We, you meeting, meeting God on Sunday in a special day speaks of your belief in the grace of God. If you meet on Saturday, you are speaking of your belief that you're kept saved and saved by the keeping of the law. Sunday speaks of the resurrection of the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ and the disciples met on the first day of the week. Check your Bible out. Okay. We are not saved by the works of the law, the Bible said. Now, 
They also tithe. You can tithe. And, and I'll tell you something. If you'll notice around here, did you know to this day, it still bothers me to take up the offering while visitors are walking in between Bible class and preaching hour. It still bothers me. I don't know exactly what to do about that. Here's the reason. I don't want you visitors walking in here and the first thing you see is a plate being passed and the devil telling you that's what this church is about because that is not what this church is about. Now we take up an offering because the Bible tells us out of love to God that we ought to give tithes and offerings and I do it gladly and cheerfully and God does, and that, but that doesn't save anybody giving to God. Okay, that would be legalism if you say, well, I gave to God and thus God ought to favor me and God ought to like me because I gave to the work of the Lord. That's not it at all. But he was religious and they tithed and they had circumcision right and uh, their ceremonial cleansing and they ate certain things in the unclean and so forth. They were very strict about that. They fasted a lot. You remember the Pharisee got up there and prayed. He said, I fast twice in the week. Now, these folks did more than all of us probably do together in the way of strict, separate work. Okay. But they were not saved. And this is what I want to get across to this morning. I do not want this church being a legalistic church. I have been charged with legalism from people because I preach on standards, because I preach on issues, but that has never been true. I asked a woman who uh, got mad at me at this church one time and they left and she charged me with preaching legalism. And I said, these, all my messages are on tape. Would you please bring me one single message where I have ever preached legalism that a man is saved by doing uh, the works of the law or by doing standards. And she never brought me no tape, but I'm just saying this to you. You don't, you let the devil tell you that because I preach on dress and because I preach on this and this, that, and the other, that I preach, that's what saves you. I have never preached that. I do not believe that. And I never will believe that because that's not what the Bible teaches. Okay. I am a grace preacher. We are saved by grace, kept by grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want that clear. But just because we're saved by grace does not mean that we should not, by the grace of God, try to live in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I believe. Okay. And I also believe this, that when we sin, we ought to be honest about it. And ain't nobody in here, especially from the pulpit back. That doesn't sin. You tell me you don't ever sin. The Bible says you're a liar and the truth's not in you. The deal is, is how are you going to deal with sin whenever, you know, by the way, when you get saved, that's what God wants is just honesty on the inward parts and don't deny it. Don't, don't act like you didn't just be honest about it and say, I sin Lord, but it's also with a godly sorrow because if we love the Lord and are saved, it grieves us to sin against our heavenly father. Well, anyway, they fasted and they observed holy days, but they were self-righteous and they were proud and they were hypocrites. Now, he was not only religious, but he was rich. I don't think there's nothing inherently long, wrong with being rich other than the fact that it's very dangerous, according to Scripture. I believe that most of us will thank God in heaven that he never made us rich. When we look back and see eternity and what it did to people. I agree with Brother Ruckman. I'd sure, it's always nice to have a little more. And the money's nice. You've got to have a little bit. But the truth about it is, if you look back historically and look around you about people who got more money than they really needed, it's very dangerous to their spiritual livelihood and especially to their succeeding generations. But he was rich. You find that out in John chapter 19. He's the one who brought a hundred uh, 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 weight of uh, myrrh and incense for the body of Jesus Christ. You don't do that without being rich. He was in the elite rich religious section of this Israeli world. Uh, he was also a ruler, according to John chapter three, verse one. So he was he was religious. He was rich and he was a ruler. But there was something else that he had that really trips a lot of people up. And it was tripping Nicodemus up. And see, these things will keep you from being born again. This is where I'm headed. Being being religious will keep you from being born again. If you're religious out there today and you're basing your life upon how well you live and your self-righteousness can keep you coming to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Being religious will make you proud. You don't do this. You do this and you do that and then you do this. You can also, also being rich can keep you. The Bible said how hard it is for they that trust in riches to enter heaven. He said it's more easier for, I'm going to tell you something. He didn't say it's impossible, but he said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter in heaven. That's what the Bible says. That's why you ought to not be going after uncertain riches that makes wings and fly away. By the way, if you get rich, you won't trust anybody. You'll think everybody that smiles at you is wanting your money. You won't be happy about it. Okay. I'm just telling you, listen, you ought to thank God that you've got an old pickup that runs. Amen. Amen. And, uh, but he was rich and he was also a ruler. 
uh, when you get to where in ruling position, it's easy to get uh, proud and it's easy to get, think you're something when you're nothing. And God continuously has to take rulers down and take rulers down. Remember Nebuchadnezzar. He is a real prototype of the ruler and what goes on. God will put you out to pasture and God will take you down a notch or two and so forth. But he was a ruler. But there's another thing was that really got him. He was respected. Respect of other people can really keep you because that feeds into your pride. The Bible teaches in John chapter 7 that Pharisees were having a discussion about the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were questioning within the inner circle, have any of you guys believed on him yet? And Nicodemus said, do, you know, do we condemn a man before we've heard him out? And basically, he kind of gave away a little bit at that point in life. And, he, and by the way, Nicodemus was in sense a secret believer. He was trying to live in both worlds. He was trying to keep one foot in the Pharisee world and one foot in the faith of Jesus Christ. He was struggling about who Jesus Christ was. But is respected. Let me tell you something. If you're religious, this why this why you ought to pay attention to Nicodemus. He was respected. He was rich. He was a ruler, and he's religious. And yet, none of these things brought to him reconciliation with God and peace with the Lord. Now, I'm telling you what. Everybody in this world, if you watch the news or look at this world around you, they want to be they want to be religious. Most people want to be religious. By the way, atheism is a religion. It's the worship of man. Humanism is a religion. It's you, you made yourself your own god. Uh, most people want to be rich. Most people want to rule. They want to have power and they want to be respected. And when you attack those things in their life, they'll usually get mad when you try to take those things down and tear down their self-righteousness. And so he, he had all these things, but it did not save his soul. Think about this. Here's a man had all these things that the whole world wants, but it did not save his soul. And God chose this man. This is why we need to pay attention to him. God chose this man as an example to use to us about the emptiness of life and the insufficiency of all the things the world has to offer you to ever bring peace and joy and satisfaction and reconciliation to God with you. He, lo- he lay him before us in clear view to show you the vanity and the failure of religion, riches, power and respect. To give you peace, lasting peace with God. It also lays him before us to show us the absolute necessity of a man being born again. I want to tell you something. I believe Nicodemus was very, very sincere in trying to do and be what he thought he needed to be before God to be saved. And you may be very, very sincere this morning about what you think you need to do to go to heaven. But I am telling you this. All the stuff you've ever done that's good, all the activities and the ceremonies, you may have been baptized, you may have all this stuff. But if you are not born again, you will die and bust hell wide open. You must be born again. It shows us the absolute necessity of being born again of the spirit of God. The first thing that you see in this is the world's greatest tragedy. It's amazing to me that a person can be and have all that this world wishes after the religion, the riches, the rule and the respect of people. And yet die lost without God and go to a devil's hell forever. He had his beliefs, but he was also blinded by those beliefs. In verse three, Jesus knew that. And that's why he said he cannot even see. He did not even have the least bit of comprehension what it was to have faith in a substitutionary savior. Because he asked the stupid question, uh, second birth, you go, go back into your mother's womb and be born again. You would think that a man that knew, supposedly knew God, that shows that he did not know anything about true spirituality and about faith and his substitute, that he had no comprehension about the lambs from the time of Abel in Genesis clear up to the times when they brought the lambs. They were doing it right in front of him and he had no comprehension of the substitutionary sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Nicodemus was the best that this world can give you. He had culture. Now listen to me good this morning. He had culture. He had character training. Brother Barry brought this out somewhat this morning about children. It's great to have character training to your children, but you can character train your children. They'll still die and go to hell. You can teach your kids to be honest, upright citizens and they'll still die and go to hell. Your children must be born again as well as you. They are not Christians because you are a Christian. They must be individually born again. He can have training, education. By the way, you can be moral. You can be a virgin and never have committed immorality as far as anybody knows in your life and die and go to hell. Morality will not save you. Cultural practices will not save you. Character will not save you. Being a good person will not save you. You must be born again of the spirit of God. And by the way, 
don't take that word believe lightly because the Bible said that the devils believe and tremble and they're not saved. You can have an intellectual belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You can intellectually believe that He lived on this earth, that He died, that He was buried and rose again. But you have not personally received Him as your Savior, as a lost, condemned sinner, that He died for you in your place. You have never repented of your sin and received Him as the absolute necessity for a Savior and for salvation. He was the best that this world can do, and yet He was lost without God. I'm sure he was a charactered man. He was respected, but he was lost. The world's greatest tragedy is this, that a person can be educated, cultured, charactered, moral, religious, and yet die and go to hell. And I thought this week as I prepared this message, God, the greatest tragedy that could ever happen in Liberty Faith Church is for you to come to this church and grow up in this church and never be born again of the Spirit of God Almighty. I remember Joel, friend, and Joel, I hope I don't embarrass you, but their family had been coming to church here for some time. And, you know, and I know Danny and, 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 uh, and, and Connie have done their best to raise their kids for the Lord. I know that they put their heart into this thing. OK, uh, they they they've sacrificed. They've done a lot. I, you know, I've watched their life. But I will never forget the night that Joel Friend got saved. Joel was a charactered young man. He was, a, I mean, he was a talented young man, an educated young man. He was exposed to some of the best education that you can get on the face of this globe. But I will never forget the statement and the honesty that came out of his heart. He was not born again. And I believe outside, in the, out here in the parking lot, he got born again in the spirit of God and came in and told the church. What I'm saying to you, it's right in front of us. And that makes me tremble because wouldn't it be a horrible thing for a young man like Joel to have grown up in this church and not have been born again where the spirit of God is not working. The greatest tragedy that I can think about to happen in this church is for you to come to this church. For some of you Wilson kids to have sat within 15 feet of this pulpit and to have never been born of the spirit of God and die and go to hell. To me, that'd be the worst tragedy. I cannot imagine anything worse than that. And I'm asking you today as your pastor, as your friend, as a person that loves you, please don't look at me. You won't see very good, much good. But would you ask yourself today, don't, don't, have you really been born again? Have you really come to God with a repentant heart, acknowledging that you're a sinner and clinging to the cross of Calvary, that he is, that the blood of Jesus Christ was shed for you and for your sin and you place your trust alone in him? I want to tell you something. The the new birth is so mysterious. There's not a preacher on earth can explain it. Jesus made that very clear. He said, it's like the wind. You can't see it. You don't know where it came from. You know where it's going, but you can tell it. You can feel the effects of it. And right now while I'm preaching, the Holy Ghost of God, I pray, will breeze through this church. And if you're out there today, this was why this is so important to me and critical to me is I was 28 years old. I had 13 years of straight Sunday school attendance where I never missed a Sunday. And I was lost. I had heard some of the greatest preaching that I believe a boy could probably hear. And I was lost. I was not born again. And when I think about the fact that I nearly died and went to hell, religious, can you imagine my thoughts in hell? 13 years in Sunday school, but I'm in hell. That'd be a tragedy. I don't think there's any more tragedy in the world. You read of all the atrocities done across the globe against people and there's horrible, unspeakable things done. But the greatest tragedy I know of is to die without being born again of the Spirit of God and go to hell, the greatest tragedy that I know of. And I want to say plainly to each one of us today, and I say it to you in in the love of God, if you're not born again, and there's any doubt in your mind that, that you've been born again of the Spirit of God, I want to ask you to take care of that this morning the best you know. And by the way, you're going to have to believe God about it. Whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All that come to him, he will in no wise cast out. You're going to have to believe that by faith today. You can be talented. You can be gifted. You can be faithful to services. You can dress right. You can live right. You can go to the Christian school or you can home educate. You can abstain from all appearance of evil as best you know. And yet not be born again of the spirit of God and die and go to hell. This is a doctrine where there is no debate. There is no wiggle room here. This is not a doubtful disputation. You must be born again. And yet Satan and religion do their best to pervert it. 
I asked a man one time at the Springfield airport going through, give him a track, said, have you been born again? Said, yes, I was born again. I was sprinkled when I was a baby. That is not the new birth. Those who tell you going down into the baptismal waters is, and they use that text, the scripture water, and that, that water is the word. You're washed by the water of the word, the Bible says. And the Bible teaches faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. You've got to hear the word of God, the incorruptible seed planted in your heart. And the spirit of God brings that to life and faith. You can get dunked in the creek till everybody knows your social security number. All the tadpoles do and still die and go to hell. You get baptized to show that you did get born again. But they'll lie to you and they'll twist this thing and they'll pervert the scriptures to their own destruction. But when you stand at the day of judgment. The question that you're going to have to deal with, were you born again? That's the question. A lot of great people in this church love you. Thank God for you. But I can't see your heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks upon the heart. And I owe it to you. I owe it to you. To bring to bear before your heart and your mind. Have you truly been born again? We see in this text not only the greatest tragedy that a man like Nicodemus could die and go to hell. But we see the greatest truth. John chapter 3 through verses 3 through 14. We see the greatest truth. Jesus said you must be born again. Salvation is not reformation. It's not turning over a new leaf and trying to do better. Salvation is regeneration. Listen to me carefully. Salvation is when God, the Holy Ghost, comes upon you and moves in you and makes and creates a new creature in Jesus Christ, a new man. It is not a new suit on the old man. It is a new man in the old suit. God, as in Genesis chapter 1 Moved across the face of the deep when darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved and God created and God spoke and God created. And when a man comes to God in repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost of God births a new creature. The Bible calls it. He's been made a partaker of the divine nature. We've been begotten again unto a lively hope. It is begotten again by the incorruptible seed of the word of God. And there is a new creature, a new man. It is not an overhaul job. It is not reformation. This is the greatest truth I know of. The greatest truth is that the new birth is a new creation of God. It is not you trying to do better. And by the way, if you ever understand that, then you'll easily understand the doctrine of eternal life. Because he's created in true righteousness and true holiness. He is born of the spirit of God. He is a new man. And then you have, you, you don't eradicate that flesh in this life. You have the old flesh and you have the spirit. The Bible said the two are contrary one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, the Bible said, put off the old man and put on the new man. It's pictured in the ark of Noah with the dove and with the raven that you have two natures in you when you're saved and you're in Christ. And what I'm saying to you today, the greatest truth you're ever going to know is that being born again is not Religious activity, it's not tithing, it's not dressing right, it's not all this stuff. It's being born again of the Spirit of God where the Spirit of God comes into your literal body and births a new man in Jesus Christ, born of the Spirit of God. He regenerates your spirit. It's not reformation, it's regeneration. I want to tell you why America is in a mess. It's because we have ceased to preach regeneration and we've preached reformation. And we've got a bunch of lost people sitting in American churches who do not have within them the power to stand and live upon the truth. And every wind that blows through, they're caving into it. The world's greatest truth. Salvation is of the Lord. It's not of you and I. Salvation is grace. Salvation is a gift. It's believing in the heart. And I want to hone in on something here a little bit. Salvation is believing. On. The Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Believing. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he has saved us. And let me say something to you about bringing your children to Christ. Unless your children understand the need for mercy, they, still, they are not at the age of accountability. 
unless they understand their need for mercy of God because we are saved by his mercy. One who understands mercy understands that they are guilty and deserve of, of the punishment of Almighty God. A person who sees no need of mercy is not in an understanding of the salvation of substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And I believe this is why we have so many false converts. In preachers' desire to see people saved and add this and be able to say this and be able to get people, quote, in. They're leaving out that mercy that's needed. Let me tell you something. The man, this is why the only prayer I know about in the Bible given to get salvation is where a man said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And this is what scares me to death. I haven't heard that in 20 years. And very seldom, to be honest with you, do you see people who even claim to be saved have a spirit and an attitude of God, please be merciful to me. I deserve hell, but God, I want your mercy. It's the greatest truth that we'll ever hear that we must be born again of the spirit of God. The greatest text is then given to us in John three sixteen. I want you to have your Bibles open. I want you to read it together with me out loud. Let's begin. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the greatest text in the world. Amen. The greatest text in the world. You see the greatest being there is God. You see the greatest love there is so loved. You see the greatest gift he gave. You see the greatest savior, his son, the greatest price, his blood, the greatest sacrifice, his life, the greatest opportunity, whosoever. Whew. Brother, don't you like that? Amen. Whosoever. Whosoever. The greatest opportunity, the greatest act, believeth. Oh, aren't you glad? You know, <laughs> Somebody's telling me about a guy that got saved here a while back and he was near death or something and they, he, he wanted to be baptized and they couldn't get him baptized so they threw a pan of water over him. You know, if I thought you were saved by baptism, I'd always wonder if that got the job done. <laughs> I'm glad the greatest act you'll ever do is just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, I'll tell you what, I'm glad that old thief on the cross could just believe. I'm glad you can be laying on your deathbed and just believe. I'm just glad you can be sitting in your pew this morning and just believe. You know God, what God just wants out of you? He just wants you to trust Him. He just wants you to believe on Him. I want you to know something. The older I get, the dumber I am. I'm more confused now about this stinking life than I ever was. When I was 23, I thought I knew all the, what, was, what was wrong and how to fix it. Now all I know is Jesus died for me. I don't know why there's so much sin in the world. I don't know why everybody's killing each other. I don't even know why I'm so sorry like I am. I don't know why Christians treat each other like they treat each other. I don't understand, I don't understand why God let the devil loose. I don't know why I ever let him in the Garden of Eden. I don't know nothing. How y'all want to come to a church where a preacher don't know nothing? But I know this. And this is where I rest my heart, my whole being. I just believe. I'm like the old disciple said, where else can I go, Lord? To whom shall we turn? But I believe this book. And I believe Jesus died for me on the cross. And I believe he rose from the dead. And there my soul rests. If I didn't have that anchor this morning within the veil, I don't know where I'd be. The greatest act, believing. The greatest object, him. Amen. Believeth on him. The greatest promise shall not perish. I'm going to tell you something. It's impossible for God to lie. You place your faith in Jesus Christ. He burst a new man in you. You're not going to hell. And I say that flat out and unashamedly and both feet on the ground. A saved, a saved man don't go to hell. 
saved people are saved. They've been given eternal life, by the way, and that's the greatest possession you'll ever possess is eternal life. What's that last two words? Everlasting life. That's what I believe in. Somebody says you believe in eternal security. I believe in eternal life. That is security. The greatest text you're ever going to read right there in front of you. You're not going to read nothing on the internet and ever get close to that. Unless you're reading that. You're not going to look in the Library of Congress and all the writing and books in the world and ever read a greater text than what you just read. So here's what we've got. The world's greatest tragedy that a man can be rich, respected, a ruler, and all that, and religious, and still die and go to hell. That's a tragedy. The greatest tragedy in the world is you could sit in church and never be born again. There's the greatest truth that you must be born again. And then we looked at the greatest text for God so loved the world that he gave. The final thing I want to preach to you this morning, and I'm trying to preach this in the solemnity that it needs to be preached in, is the world's greatest test Jesus gives right after those verses. He said, men love darkness. He said, they won't come to light. You know what he's telling you? That you're given a test. What are you going to do with Jesus Christ? The greatest test you're ever going to have in your life was not finals at some college. The greatest test you're ever going to have in your life is will you humble yourself, admit you're a sinner, and come to Jesus Christ. You see, what was happening with Nicodemus was what's happening with all of us. And what happened to Pilate? What shall I do then with this man called Christ? He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. The greatest test you'll ever have to deal with. What are you going to do with Jesus Christ? The test is not whether you're a sinner and condemned. He says you already are. We already are. The greatest test is not comparing yourselves among yourselves. That's not wise. You can always find somebody living as good as you are, at least as far as you know. The greatest test is not weighing your good against your bad. The greatest test, according to Christ in John chapter 3, there in the verses down through there, is will you come to the light? Will you come to the light? Or will you reject it? So I ask you this morning, you may have the greatest truth, and you may have the greatest text, but the greatest test you're ever going to do and have facing you is what have you done with Jesus Christ? When you face eternity, it will do you no good to say, I was faithful there at Liberty Faith Church. I gave money there. I helped. I prayed. I did this, that. And the question is going to be, where are you born again? And if you don't have that, all the rest that we're doing don't amount to anything. I close with two Bible examples about men who face this test. In Acts chapter 24, there's a man named Felix. He was the governor. Paul was brought before him. And the apostle Paul reasoned to this leader, this governor, about righteousness, judgment, and so forth. And this is what Felix said, one of the most tragic statements you'll ever read in the Bible. He said, the Bible said he trembled. I was reading that this week and I thought, Lord... I don't even know the last time I ever seen anybody tremble at the power of God and the judgment of God. But I can tell you something you're going to. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And the Bible says this. He trembled after Paul gave him the gospel and warned him. And then he said this, Paul, go your way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Did you know you can read your Bible from there to Revelation and you never find again that Felix had the opportunity to call Paul and say, Paul, would you tell me one more time about the gospel? He trembled. 
You can't even get folks to do that now in America. And he was a pagan ruler. He said, uh, Paul, I want, I want to think about this. As far as we know, Felix died and went to hell. Did you know that God doesn't owe you one more time after this morning? He doesn't owe you one more time. I give you another example in Acts chapter 26, verse number 28. Paul was brought before King Agrippa. And there again, Paul preached the gospel to a king. And Agrippa said this. Almost. Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Some of you right now are in the middle of that test. And you're saying, I want to think about this one more Sunday. A more convenient time. I've got some things I, I'm really not done with yet. And more convenient time. I'll, I'll hear this later. Or maybe some of you is listening to the lie of the devil. And you think almost. And you're standing there today and suddenly you say Almost. Thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And I say with the Apostle Paul, Oh, would to God that thou were all together a Christian. Let's bow our heads together. I want to be very plain and very simple this morning. I am not the Holy Ghost. I am simply a preacher, messenger of the Word of God. Probably nobody in the world enjoys life more than I do. Appreciates the sun rises and the sun sets and the rain and the, and the green trees and the grass than I do. And the joy of the Lord, blessings of God. I am so grateful that God, by his sweet mercy, one day brought me to the truth that though I was religious, I was lost. And I want to tell you today from all the kindness of glory. If you're not saved, if you're not born again in the spirit of God. Do you have peace in your heart with the Lord today? Are you resting on the blood of Jesus Christ that it was shed for your sin and that you've personally received him and applied it to your heart? I ask you today this question that probably only you can answer in God. Are you truly born again you must be born again and I just want to say this to you today that if you're not sure about your new birth I'd like for you to get out of your seat I want to invite you to come to the front of this church I'd like for you to kneel one of these altars over here and I want you to talk to God. And I'd like for you to pray something along these lines. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Maybe you're saying, well, preacher, does a person need to get out of their seat? No, you can be saved there, but I'll be honest with you. It'd be better if you got out of your seat. It'd shake off some of that pride. And you see, Nicodemus was slipping around trying to live in both worlds as a not a good place to be. The Bible said if you're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of you. You need to quit worrying about what other people think. You need to get freed from that bondage. You need to be only concerned about what God knows. And so I'm asking you in the next few moments right now, if you'll just get up out of your seat, you're here today, and you'd be honest enough and you care enough about your soul that you'd step out and come forward. Say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. I'm asking you to come right now. Right now. You say, please, would you play some music? It'd be easier. No, I ain't going to play no music. I don't think it's going to be music at judgment to make it easier. Would you come? Anywhere in this building today, is there a heart anywhere that the Lord spoke to you? And I need to be born again. I need to be born again. Anywhere in this building. Quickly. You'd come.
If not, let's stand. Father in heaven, I pray. that every person in this building has truly been born again. And I pray, Lord, that if they're not, that you'll not let this message get away from them. And I pray for your extended mercy in their lives, that before you take them out of this world, that they'll come to be born again, place their faith in Jesus Christ. Bless this message, Lord, to your glory. And Lord, I pray tear up the devil's kingdom with it in Jesus' name.